Hey, welcome everybody. We're going to take a look at Chain of Command, some rules for World War II platoon combat. This is awesome. It's by Two Fat Lardies. And I wish I could say I have the book. I kind of do. Actually, I got the tablet edition. So uh, I thought I would, you know, pull out the uh, Murphy table now that I've got that set up. I don't have any models out. Um, but what I want to do is take some time here to go over what is possibly in the book. I say possibly in the book because I did get the tablet edition, not the book. Um, I got the tablet for a couple of reasons. One, I didn't want to wait for shipping for the book to get from the UK all the way over here. Some people who pre-ordered already have their books, but I'm kind of impatient like that. Um, I got the tablet edition because it has in it links that refer to parts of the book within the book. So I'll show you some links here, but like here's the, uh, I guess you'd call this a good table of contents. So if you want to know about close combat, just click close combat. There you go. Go back to the contents when you're done. And there's a contents link at the bottom of every page so you can quickly come back here for reference. Now there's a regular PDF version, um, but my reasoning from what I was reading, if folks who bought the tablet edition are viewing this in a like their iBooks reader or something like I tried running this on my wife's Kindle and it didn't recognize the links but it's still read as a PDF so it's still fully functional whether you're using something that supports the links or not so if you get the tablet edition you're getting an enhanced version that um, you know is gonna work no matter what whereas if you get just the PDF version I'm assuming it doesn't have links and so it's just a static document so if you get the tablet, you kind of get the best of both worlds, I think. That's my opinion. Or at least that's why I'm justifying the tablet. Oh, and I got the tablet edition too because it's the same price. It was the same price as the static PDF, so I thought, well, why not? All right, so anyway, that's why I got the tablet edition. So I'm sure the print edition doesn't have working links either. So if you just like books, you'll just have to flip the pages like normal people. All right, so a uh, good cover. You got your contents. Now, obviously, if you've got the PDF or the actual book, uh, your contents will be a lot different. But this is what it looks like on the tablet. And let's just kind of briefly go through the different parts of the book, quote unquote book. Uh, there's your introduction. And I'm telling you, I got this because I have not played bolt action. And bolt action, from my understanding, I could be wrong, is kind of the equivalent playing size to this game, to Chain of Command, where it's a platoon plus, the plus being the support to your platoon. So a vehicle, airplane, something. It's not designed to have 30 tanks and a whole bunch of infantry. It's designed to be that platoon that you navigate across the board to hit your objective. I mean, which I mean, I guess you could do that with a lot of games, but that's the focus. And the only game that I know of with that that's a big mass market is bolt action. So the reason I got this, though, is, um, let me see, let me get to why I got this. This reason right here, the patrol phase. Not the only reason, but a big reason. When I was searching through the internet trying to find out Chain of Command and why I would be of interest to this, because this just released, I believe, August 21st of 2013. So um, at the time of this recording, I don't even know what today is, the 25th, I think. Uh, so just a few days ago, it came out. It has a lot of unique aspects, and this is one of those unique aspects, the patrol phase. When you're doing a scenario, and they have like six scenarios in here, um, it's not just a simple you place 12 inches within your side of the board. They actually have kind of a, a almost a random starting location. I say random because you and your opponent get to decide those starting positions. And you do that by using the patrol phase. Now I don't have the board set up to demo it. They have, two fat lardies have some videos themselves that kind of discuss this process. So, you know, go go search YouTube, find their videos. So I'm just going to briefly recap that part of the book. 
But what you do here in the patrol phase is essentially you have these markers which represent your scouts, if you will, and they start at one end of the board and you move one marker up to 12 inches, then your opponent moves one and you go back and forth and you move these markers, one marker within 12 inches of another marker, making one continuous chain. And here in the example, you could either have a straight line or you could make kind of a, you know, a deep cut thrust into the board towards your opponent. And that's cool because after those markers are locked down, when they get within 12 inches of an enemy, they lock down. And when all the patrol markers are locked down, you then get to place what are called jump off points. The jump off points come back about 12 inches, if available, towards your side of the board within cover, ideally. Um, and once you place those jump off points, boom, that's where your troops get to deploy onto the table. And the theory is that it's saying at the beginning of the game, your scouts are coming onto the table and they are finding out what sides of the board or what parts of the board are clear of the enemy and are safe. You know, basically your side has control of that part of the table. So I'm thinking in my head how cool that would be. Because even if you made your own scenarios and you put an objective, say, at the center of the board or two objectives on on either side of the board. It almost reminds me of playing Settlers of Catan when you do the initial road laying process and you're trying to go for that you know the longest road bonus. You're laying your patrol markers out in such a fashion that you want to deploy close to an objective and if your opponent sees that then he's going to start laying his deployment markers to try and cut you off and prevent you from going where you want to go. And that's important because later in the game, you actually have opportunities where you can move your deployment or your drop-off points. So you can really kind of screw with your opponent if you see what they're trying to accomplish as far as objectives go. So I thought that was a pretty cool aspect. Now, another cool thing, the command and control. Instead of just having a I go, you go, or um, saying, you know, just randomly draw a colored unit chit from a bag. You know, lots of games do that. Um, but it really makes it hard to try and coordinate teams that you control because you don't know what's coming up next. So that's a great representation of fog of war. But even in real war, you know, your side, your your platoon commander, your squad leaders, they, they have some control, you know, that they might say, hey, that machine gun lay down fire, we're moving up, kind of a thing. But it's really hard to replicate that in a chit draw system. So in, in the um, you know here, what is really cool in the chain of command is each side, depending on their quality, gets to roll dice. And depending on what you roll, that determines kind of how many teams you can activate. And then if your team gets to go again in the current phase, uh, you know, so without getting too long-winded, I already am, I'm just so excited, uh, your turn is broken down into phases. And depending on how you roll your dice, your units could actually act in several phases back to back with random activations within your phase to move just a couple teams or several squads. So if you know how much you get to move in that one phase, you can kind of coordinate movement. So that, that really helps you develop some sense of control as to how you might want to coordinate movement. And then your opponent, you know, if they have things set on Overwatch, can interrupt that, but it does give you a chance to try and coordinate your teams better. So I thought that was cool. Uh, moving on here, let's see here, another section. Well, as I'm going through the command dice section, it's neat because depending on how you roll, you can either activate teams or entire squads. And the way that the things break down is you'll you'll have your squads and your squads are made up of teams. So there might be like the machine gun element and the rifle team element. So they can either move as a group or depending on how you roll, you might be able to activate just the machine gun portion or just the rifles. Oh, you can't see my fingers. So here we go. Rifle team, machine gun team, either move them all together or 
activate one team or one team. So if you really want to see that in action, I might put up my own video or go take YouTube. Two Fat Lardies have a good demo on that. Chain of Command points. Um, again, based on your dice rolls, you have the ability to earn a, a Chain of Command. I call it a point. You build up, you earn these Chain of Command points. They can be used to get special actions into turn. Basically, good ways to benefit your team. So that's kind of neat. That's not one of the big reasons I got the game, but it's just a nice, pretty cool little thing. Uh, phase sequence. Um, just kind of explaining, you know, how the turns go. Turns are made up of phases. Phases can either go back and forth between players, or one player could maintain control of the phases for a while. Random events could happen depending on your roles. Infantry movement is also interesting. You know, not only is it affected by terrain, but it's affected by how many dice you get to roll. Um, so there's like tactical movement, normal movement, or like double movement. And then there's, um, let's see, what do they call that? Well, I guess it's at the, at the double, but three movement modes. Oh, here they are. So tactical movement, you roll one die six for your team or squad if you activate a whole squad. Tactical movement um, basically is your people trying to hug the ground and find protection as they move forward. Normal movement, they roll two die six. Um, at the double, three die six. So tactical movement, you can move and fire. Normal movement, you can move and fire, but you get like uh, half your dice for firing. And then if you move at the double, there's no firing because you're just all out balls to the wall trying to get somewhere. Um, I like the element of random movement because it shows your team or squad is not necessarily 100% sure of the, you know, maybe the best path or, you know, you the commander are telling them to move forward but the men on the ground in that situation can look at the ground and say well this is the best path but we have to slow our advance because we're trying to get you know the best cover elements so I kinda like that kind of implementation of fog of war you know I the squad leader might say okay guys move out but they may be more cautious than I thought they would be so it's kinda cool a little bit of randomness to it might not be for everyone, but I'm going to I'm going to give it a whirl. I think it will work out in the end. So, movement. They have rules for moving in buildings and terrain and all that kind of stuff. So, typicals. Um, target acquisition is cool because like damage, targeting, shooting, everything's based on your team. So, you don't have to worry about necessarily individual people, but you're going to check to see you know, does my team get to fire? And then from my team, how many enemy targets are in the open? So it's kind of, I have to play it a couple times. I haven't played it. I just got my PDF here, my, my tablet edition. But from my understanding, it looks like I might target an enemy team, but I can only shoot at the enemies that are exposed on that team. So like if there's, like in this example here, um, if I had people in the right position, my team is going to shoot at his team. Um, but see, in this example here, the line of sight is blocked because of this building. But let's say I had some folks on kind of the far side of the building. If I only had two guys from my team that was activated to shoot, then I'd only get to roll two attack dice for those people because those are the only ones that can see the enemy team. And if only two people on the enemy team are exposed, those are the guys who are going to take the uh, the shots. So you can't arbitrarily assign damage to the entire team that's you know hidden in cover. It pretty much goes to the people you can see. So you target a team, but then only apply damage from your folks that can actually see line of sight to those folks that are actually exposed. So it works out, but just you know it kind of seems at first you know you're working team on team but only the exposed members of the team. I guess that's a good way to put it. Uh, and here's just another example of diagram where they're talking about line of sight. There's no shooting through people. So even though these guys here are the same team or same squad, they can't shoot through one another. So when you're lining your people up to make a, an advancing firing type of squad, you really need to think about spacing, line them in a line, 
That way you get the maximum frontage of firing kind of a thing. Because it goes both ways. If you're assigning hits, the hits get assigned to the exposed members of that team. You know, so just kind of think about how you want to uh, spread your folks out for taking casualties or bringing the maximum firepower to bear. There's rules now for shooting over people's heads, like if you're on tanks or in buildings or on hills. So you can shoot over people, you just can't shoot through them. What else we got? Uh, let's see. When you get to infantry fire, it's actually very cool. Um, kind of like Flames of War, when you go to shoot people, you're shooting them based on the target's experience level because they know how to take advantage of the terrain to hide and cover. Um, then when you're doing for after you roll for hits to see who's been hurt, damaged, killed, you know, the saves, if you will, that's based on the cover type. There's different things that modify your cover types. Like if you do um, tactical movement, you get bonuses. If you're on a some kind of support weapon that's got a gun shield that gives you bonuses to your cover so uh, here's what I like about it and why this is the biggest reason why I got it there's no limits to your range on shooting okay let me explain their grand scale their ground scale is 12 inches is 40 yards so 1 foot 40 yards if you play on a standard 6 foot long table that's about 240 yards. My math isn't the best, but 6 times 40, oh, maybe 320. No, 4 times 6. I went to public school, so anyway. Math it out. 24, 240. 240. Okay, so 240 yards on a 6-foot table. Rifles can shoot that easy. How well they shoot that kind of depends on the person shooting the weapon. So instead of just saying that your gun can only shoot you know 18 inches and then stops you can't shoot any further what it says is if you shoot beyond a certain distance it's a little more difficult to hit stuff but man rifles can shoot far so barring line of sight or terrain obstacles you can shoot people at the far end of your table to me that makes sense when I compare that with a lot of games I have and they put arbitrarily you know like you know this weapon shoots that far anything beyond that is lost I have a hard time dealing with that because it doesn't make sense. Um, so if I go all the way back, he talks about this. I say he, Mr. Richard Clark. He wrote an article on the internet and in here, maybe it's in the introduction. Yeah, it talks about the scales. So this game works with any scale that you have. 48, 35s, 28s, 20s. The ideal scales would be uh, like 28 and 20, and if you're doing the 12 inches is 40 yards, they say 15 millimeter is the closest realistic representation to that scale, because your your one 15 millimeter figure equals about a six foot tall man. So this would be perfect rules as written for 15 millimeter, but works really good with 20 and 28. Um, when I compare that with bolt action, to be fair. I have not played bolt action, but bolt action has arbitrary limits set on your weapon ranges, to my understanding. And so, uh, in a lot of war games, not just bolt action, because that's an unfair comparison having never played it, but I do know of war games that say, hey, if you're going to shoot beyond this limit, those shots are lost. And so that brings debates of, oh, well, my tape measure says I'm at 17 inches. That puts me half an inch beyond the maximum range of your weapon. And that just doesn't do it for me. So this brought kind of an element of realism that I thought was really, really cool. So yeah, we're now 20 minutes in just for me to say why I like the game. Alright, so let's look at some more parts of the... I say book. Uh, let's go. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, so infantry fire anti-tank. They have vehicle rules because that's part of the plus. Support weapons are important to know uh, because when you buy your platoon, depending on your platoon quality, uh, you get support weapons. You can get, you know, some uh, mortars and, and depending on the size of your mortar, like medium mortars, artillery and things, those aren't even on the board because they're, you know, again, based on realistic ranges, 
those are able to probably to shoot several tables away. So a lot of that stuff will be based on off table elements. Then there's a vehicle section. Um, you know, I don't know how I feel about vehicles yet. Probably I just need to get in here and, and, and play them out, whether solo or make my wife come in and play. Um, but you know, it has vehicles, you know, all the stuff you would expect, you know, shooting them, damaging them, rolling, running over troops, troops using anti-tank vehicle weapons and stuff. So all of those things are there. Until I play it, I can't tell you how abstracted it is or how detailed it is. The infantry combat is really nice when I compare that to, say, Battlegroup Kursk. Battlegroup Kursk, to me, is super cool for fielding lots of tanks. This limits that to maybe, you know, a couple vehicles, but um, the infantry is really detailed. So I don't know how, how detailed the vehicles will be here. So we'll talk about it another time. Here's your close combat rules section. They even had, they do have this cool. Uh, a section on ramming from tanks to tanks. So you can play World of Tanks and ram each other. Uh, shock. So, you know, you have to deal with, um, I guess the best way to think of shock is suppression. Um, you know, but yeah, your folks get shot at. You got to deal with shock. If they take too much shock, they run away. Force morale. Um, it made me think about a group curse because you have a force morale. So you're not drawing cards to total your force morale, but it's kind of a similar con concept. If your team takes too much force morale penalties, if you will, they could retire from the side of battle. So um, at least you know at some point you're not going to necessarily fight to the very last man. You probably could. Um, I'll have to play to kind of see how the force morale plays out. I know that when I did Battle Group Kursk and I played a 350 point game, my Russians had 32 battle rating points and they were actually able to absorb a lot of losses because they just kept drawing you know these these uh, battle rating cards and they didn't want to retreat for nothing because they just could absorb those losses so I'll have to see how that's reflected here you know um, my Russians bring a lot to the table are they able to absorb a lot of losses because they have so many men it'll be interesting to see how it plays out but you do have force morale and you got tracking for it. And then you talk about specialty type items. Uh, you know, not to give you too much, just to show you there's quite a bit. And then there's one page of advanced rules. So really, up to this point, uh, the rules are about 70 pages. Vehicles take up a small portion of that. So just to get a good feel for the platoon and infantry combat, you know, maybe 60 pages or so. Again, not good with math, public school. And then how to play a chain of command, like how to pick your scenario. And then how to set them up. And there were six scenarios. Uh, so it's not necessarily a competitive points type game system. I don't think that's what they were going for. But what they were trying to do was say, hey, you know, if you wanted to just, you know, get with a buddy, you have the models and figures, just kind of randomly roll for a scenario, build you up a quick little army, and go to war. So... I mean, at some point you probably could use this for competitive play because they do have a point system, but I don't think it's as finely tuned as, you know, some people who want a competitive system. That doesn't mean it can't be, but that, that basic premise is there. Random scenarios, point system, let you play quick games, or maybe organize a little tournament. Then you have your national army lists. Um, so just to show you, like for example here, uh, you might play a, a standard Germany infantry platoon, and it simply tells you here's what's in your platoon headquarters, here's your squads. So, real simple to make your platoon. One headquarters, three squads, and this is the configuration. Each squad contains two teams. One team is a light machine gun team, one team is a rifle team. And as you play the game and you're activating units, then you're either activating... Um, you know, a team within that squad, or you can activate the whole squad, depending on how you roll. So we have Germany, Britain, United States, Russia, well, Soviet Union, 
and then let's see here that that pretty much brings us to the end um, you got your some tables and then this was like some really cool um, insights to kind of what the thought process is to some of the game ideas what's cool is for say national abilities powers if you will they don't really have that those are actually kind of built into the platoons and the squads and I don't I don't know if I want to how how well I can explain this but instead of saying you know Russia gets special double movements or you know Germany gets to reroll all kinds of dice for different things it's kind of like it's built into how their squads and their teams are set up and what their support weapons are because that's what it's replicating is um, you know kind of the squad construction actually used in World War II so if your squad has like an LMG team that's and, a, and your rifle team which how most of them have but let's say you bought a mortar team uh, the British I believe get more smoke than high explosives for their mortars so they're more likely to use their mortars for cover and concealment to maneuver their teams Rats, say Soviet Union might get mortars that have high explosive no smoke because they're used to try and blunt and destroy the enemy and the rifle teams don't really necessarily maneuver they just go straight forward so those national characteristics are built into the support weapons and the actual platoon construction that you have I thought that was cool so you don't have to try to remember you know this guy gets blitzkrieg move this guy gets a stall 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 you just simply have to play your nation to its composition of troops and support weapons. I thought that was cool. Uh, let's see what else we have here. That, that pretty much brought us to the, the end of the book. Uh, so this book, if I was going to compare it to something I currently have, it would be Battle Group Kursk. And without having the actual book, I can't compare if it's glossy pages, you know, what the binding is like. Battle Group Kursk is a really, really good, good, sturdy book. Um, so if we're going to talk about content, the content for Chain of Command here is pretty much focused on the rules needed to play. I'm going to say not as much fluff on history and things because, frankly, you can find all kinds of history. Just hit the internet, find a library. You got all the history you want. Battle Group Kursk book actually included a modeling section, history about the time period covered, and when I was thinking about it, it would be really hard for Chain of Command to put in a history section because it covers a very wide bit of history. You can pretty much use this to game out any time period of World War II. Whereas Battle Group Kursk, they're able to focus on history because it's focusing on one specific time in one specific conflict, on one specific kind of battle, in that time period so they're able to talk specifically about weapons tactics you know things that happen on this day so they can include all the fluff um, it would be real hard to include a lot of fluff in here so that makes it a much more efficient book get right down to the rules get right on the table and play so overall I'm not disappointed one bit with my digital purchase so I would highly recommend uh, you know either getting the print book you just have to wait for it to ship and I don't know what the shipping rate is like that's kinda of why I went digital so quite a bit of information here oh but I will say this though laid out great it's a pleasure to read um, two columns it's not like three like you know ASL or Tobruk or something where it's just all crammed on the pages um, it actually reads out really well has a lot of examples that's one thing I'm gonna say I really like about it over the battle group Kursk book is it has lots of examples uh, with some good diagrams showing you know troops and stuff it might not be the best plays of example but it actually is is better than nothing so really good and it's got color pictures lots of charts so uh, it's a really good rule set there's already some questions coming out if you hit the uh, the Yahoo message group for this you know so I can't say just because people are asking questions that doesn't mean it's poorly written it just means people are getting in there and trying to break stuff and um, Richard I think his name's Richard he's been very kind even though he's trying to do some vacation time 
uh, he's in there answering questions and helping to clarify things. So it's got a very good active community willing to help each other answer questions. So let me share, I'm going to share my, uh, my problem that I had, which is all on me because I'm ignorant to the ways of the internet. I wanted to buy the digital rules and so far the only place you can buy them is on the two fat lardies. So who knows by the time you see this in the future sometime uh, you might be able to get digital rules elsewhere. Um, but I did not know that PayPal because that was the only option I saw was either pay them a check or use PayPal. I know nothing of PayPal really because I didn't know I could use it to make a credit card purchase and then if you're trying to buy from you know, overseas, it converts your currency to the currency of where you're buying so you can purchase. So you don't have to worry about carrying, you know, British pounds or German marks or anything like that or the euro. Um, your regular whatever will convert over using PayPal. So I, I hope I didn't cause too much controversy over there because I was like, well, where can I buy this in America? And I didn't want people thinking oh, I'm an elitist. It's I didn't know I could use PayPal to do that. Um, so if you're curious in getting the rules, uh, even the printed copy, if you can't find it anywhere but two fat lardies, use the PayPal. You'll be able to purchase it. I just don't know if the physical rules have a shipping cost, but the digital just came to my email and I've got it now. So check them out. Oh, so cost. I think I paid, because again, I'm not very good altogether with math. Um, I think altogether it was about $20 for the digital copy that you have here and like here's the links you just click on a link and it takes you to that part of the book um, so like twenty dollars because it's like thirteen pounds so whatever that is in your currency it'll automatically convert through PayPal I know that now so that's what it is uh, this is a very long video I know but I like to talk a lot and I'm pretty excited about these rules so I'm hoping other people check them out I'm hoping I can get some stuff posted up on Board Game Geek um, last I looked, there is a pending page about to go up for Board Game Geek on Chain of Command. So I just have to wait for that to come up and then maybe we can kind of post together. But if not, hit the Yahoo groups and you'll see a very active community for all the two Fat Lardy games. So I will let you go. Going to watch some preseason football. Have a good evening and uh, we'll talk to you later. Leave comments if you have questions or you know just want to educate me further about PayPal. And we'll talk to you later.